Hello everyone and welcome to this members only live stream that we are going to be doing today and we are very excited about it. It is October and if any of you have been watching for any length of time you know that I am fascinated with the Norman Conquest, the Battle of Hastings and things like that. So we can't let an October go by without getting into that. So today we're going to look specifically at the weapons and the armor of the Norman Conquest and specifically the Battle of Hastings. We're not going to go into the history. We have other past live streams. Hopefully you can go back and take a look at those. But today we're going to start out talking about the different types of soldiers and the different weapons they would have used. So my base here is basic 11th century clothing. Now the quality would have varied depending upon your socioeconomic status, but basically it's going to consist of the same thing I have on uh, my braids, which are basically my medieval underwear, my 11th century underwear, and to that are tied braids, which are wool leggings, and they're tied on with points. I also have turn shoes that are just a, a single layer of leather, turned inside out, that's why we call them turn shoes, that go on my feet. And then over my upper body I have a plain white linen shirt and a wool tunic that goes over that. <clears throat> that is in effect the baseline of clothing, of male clothing from the medieval period um, from really almost 800 all the way up until you get into the 1200s. So we're smack dab here in the 11th century. This is what we're going to be working with. Now, of course, the Normans invade England and the English have to call up as many soldiers as they can. That means they're going to call up the basic levy of the Anglo-Saxons, which is called the feared. And a lot of those are going to be armed with nothing more than a spear and a shield. <clears throat> a lot of them are going to have a the basic round shield that you see from the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, the Vikings have this. We have a, a center boss here of, of iron that's going to protect the hand with a wooden plank built round shape edged in usually some sort of thicker leather like rawhide. You can see the back here. It's got a long grip so that it kind of gives that shield strength and everything's put together and this is you just hold it by the center like this. And of course you're going to have a spear. Everyone knows what a spear is. It's a stick with a big metal point on it. Let me take this opportunity to say though that when we think of the medieval period or, or almost any period in world history, we think of swords and axes and maces and things like that. Even the people who could afford those things, the spear is going to be their primary initial form of weapon. It's just so basic, it's cheap, it's easy to produce, and you can reach out a very long way and get people with it. A spear is the most popular, most useful, most effective, and most used weapon in the entire medieval, and for that matter, ancient world. But we're not talking about that today. So what you see here is a standard Anglo-Saxon fearsman. He's going to thrust with a spear, he's going to protect himself with a shield like this, and the Saxons are going to, to form that shield wall. They usually fight on foot, and they're going to put their shields side by side so they can all link up and form this very strong protective barrier with the spears that come out like this. Some of them uh, may be able to afford a sword, some of them may be able to afford a helmet, but we're moving up the social scale at this point and I want to come back to, to uh, the Anglo-Saxon elite, which are the Huskarls. The Huskarls are professional soldiers. They are fully armed and armored, but we're going to come back to that in a second when I actually put the armor on. The Normans, when they come over, have a much more professional army. They're not having to call up the levies, what we would today call the militia. They're hiring and bringing in sort of professional soldiers. So you're not going to have just a shield and spearmen. You're going to have people who come with sh uh, spears and shields, but they're going to have padded armor, uh, perhaps mail. They're going to have uh, some axes. They're going to have swords for the infantry. But the Normans bring something that the Anglo-Saxons don't have a lot of. They're going to bring archers. They're going to bring a lot of archers. Of course, the bow, this is not the long bow that we think of from the Hundred Years' War, the, where the draw weights of the bows could get up to 80, 90, or 100 pounds. That's not yet. These bows are going to be somewhere between 40 and 50 pound draw. Uh, they're not going to be something that it takes a lifetime of work to do, but they're still going to be something that you can pull and use. Now, the arrowheads 
are going to be a variety of different types. Um, some people might even bring these. This is sort of something you think of when you think of a medieval arrowhead, but this is not something used for war. This is used for hunting. Uh, and you can tell it's used for hunting because of the very broad blade. It's made to basically cut into flesh and slice and cause a lot of blood loss. And you can tell also that this is meant to be reused. I don't know if you can see that, but it has a little rivet holding the arrowhead onto the actual shaft of the arrow. So what that means is they intend to use this over and over. So we're not going to necessarily go to war with that. Much more common in warfare are a couple of other different types. You see this, it's similar to that but it's a little more uh, solid and it's a little more meant to, to bite into flesh, right? That's going to go in and those barbs are gonna make it very difficult to pull out. That's meant for horses, that's meant for going into unarmored flesh and it can be relatively effective. So we also have a couple of more common types. This is a much more common type. You see that one doesn't have the barbs, it's more pointed. And something like this is meant to penetrate as deep as it can and to perhaps pierce armor if it has enough power behind it. Um, similar to that, you're going to have what comes to be called a bodkin point. You can see how this is a very acute point and it is sort of quadrilateral it's, it's, and it's hammered down into a very specific shape, which is meant to burst those round male rings. Again, we'll show you those in a second. But this type of arrow uh, can penetrate, but it's not going to cause a lot of blood loss, but the idea is to have this get through the armor. So those Norman archers aren't really going to be aiming straight on. The idea is to shoot up like this and have the arrows go up and then plunge down on top because if you're holding your shield like this to protect from the front and the arrows start coming, you're going to put the shield up here to perhaps protect yourself but that makes you more vulnerable in here. So they may be shooting the arrows from two different points. Ha ha. Now, the Normans are, um, we tend to think of the Normans as having a different shield. This is the more old fashioned, like I said, Viking round. It's meant to fight on foot. It's very effective. You can use it like this and come in this way. But not everyone had these. Even the Anglo-Saxons, based on our best source, the Bayou Tapestry, a lot of mounted, excuse me, a lot of Anglo-Saxons that fought on foot would use a shield that had begun to develop in the 10th century and came on up that what we call a teardrop or a kite shield. You can see it's sort of round at the top, but it comes down and elongates into this point. This does a couple of different things. When you're holding this, you can see it covers more of my body, right? Um, it protects my legs. Legs are some of the most vulnerable points when you're fighting hand to hand, so it can protect the legs. So this can be an effective tool for using on foot. We'll get to how it can also be a very, very effective tool for mounted soldiers as well. Now it's time to put the armor on. We're at the point where we need to start thinking about those professional soldiers, whether they come from Normandy or whether they come from England, those Huskarls, and I'm going to get armored up. There's a lot of debate on exactly what they wore underneath the male armor in the 11th century. The problem is we honestly don't know. For that time period, we don't have any sources or any illustrations that give a good indication of what they wore under male. We even know what ancient Romans wore under their armor. We know what the medieval knights wore under their armor later on, but for the 11th century, we don't know. For the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to share one of my pet theories, which is that often they would wear simply a thicker reinforced woolen tunic underneath the armor. The problem with padding is it can help protect you more with the male, but it also begins to bulk you up and makes it a little more difficult to move. It also makes it a lot hotter to wear. And simply wearing a wool, a padded, a thicker wool tunic underneath the male is going to protect you from the cuts and from the arrows plunging, usually, 
but it's also going to allow you a much greater freedom of movement. So let me go get that armor and get it ready to put on. So I have here the classic four-in-one pattern male hauberk of the 11th century. Uh, you can see the interlocked rings. They're all riveted or solid. And a coat of mail like this would have about 30 to 40,000 individual iron links inside of it. That makes it a very expensive project, not just in terms of materials for medieval technology, but in terms of labor. That's why only the elites could afford to have this, and they had to have some sort of high economic status that would allow them to not only afford this, but some of the other weapons that we're going to show you. So let me go ahead and, uh, and put this on. It is not an, an easy thing to do. It sort of goes on like a normal shirt does, but one that weighs about 25 to 30 pounds. Get my arms through first. I don't know what this is going to do to the microphone. That's, <laughs> that's putting the armor on. You can see it, doesn't, it still doesn't cover my entire upper body. So the hauberk I have on is specifically meant for a Norman on horseback. The Normans are going to bring over a very strong force. About a third of the army is going to be mounted, and that's going to be their most important weapon, which we don't have with us today, unfortunately, is a horse. The horses are going to be specially bred and specially trained and work with the Norman all the way through their life. This is a very well-trained, expensive piece of equipment, and this hauberk is meant to fight from horseback. Let me show you. As I'm sitting, the mail sort of covers my leg here on the outside, but it's split in the front and it allows the horse and the saddle and everything to sort of be here unimpeded by the armor. So let me see if we can't do a little bit more with the armor and put on some more of the equipment. So I have here uh, the one piece of I have here the one piece of padded gear that I am going to wear today, which is a padded coif to sort of add some protection to the head. And I have a very typical 11th century helm. Some people call this a Norman helm, but lots of people were using this. It's basically a cap that goes over the top, but it has this very distinct nasal that comes down in front of the face that offers some protection, but gives a very distinctive look. So having put the helmet on, having put the, the cap on, I'm starting to approach what we think of as a Norman knight, the way he's going to look. Now let me go ahead and get the weapon that we're probably most familiar with, a sword. So what I've just done is attach the sword to my person so that I have the sword I don't always have to have it in my hand, but I can carry it around whether I'm on foot or on horseback. Now this sword, it's been blunted because this is the one I used to attack my friends when we we're playing medieval warfare. Uh, but it would normally come to a point, we have a cross guard here that goes all the way across the hand that protects the hand both from blades coming down my blade and from smashing into the shields as I attack. It has a pommel called a, a Brazil nut pommel that helps to keep my hand in place and it sort of counterbalances the weight of the blade as I swing it. So this sword is a very effective weapon, especially against an unarmored opponent. It doesn't do a lot against armor itself, but what it does is maybe I can get in between the places where the armor isn't. You can see on myself, if someone were to attack my neck, if someone were to attack my arms or my legs, that could be an effective tactic. Now you can see this assemblage of straps on the back of the shield looks kind of gangly and there's a lot to it, but there's a reason for that. And this is based on the Bayou Tapestry again. You can see in, on different shields in the tapestry there are different ways of holding it, which leads me to believe that anyone who has their own shield is going to pick the method they like best and make that the way that they have their shield rigged up, just like soldiers today do with the way they carry their weapons. It's all going to be personal preference. So now I have this shield. I have my armor on. 
I have my helmet protecting me, and you can see I've got kind of a, a good defensive area. And those Norman soldiers on foot, this is how they're going to look. Again, they're going to use a spear as their main weapon. They're going to have a shield that, to protect themselves. They're going to be carrying a sword so that they can fall back to that if they lose their spear or it breaks or it gets stuck in an opponent and it's too hard to pull out. But this is how the Norman infantry are going to appear. Now the Norman elites are, of course, are going to have more money than the foot soldiers, so they're going to have more equipment and more protective equipment. What I have here is a male coif that I'm going to put on my head so that you can see how the very top Normans would be armoring themselves. All right, so a Norman knight on horseback is going to have this fully armored approach. They're going to have their spear and they're going to have their shield. But the shield has a particular strap called a gi strap because if I'm on horseback, I have to control the horse with my reins. So I'm going to put this over myself like this. So using the reins to guide the horse, I can then take my spear and thrust down this way on either side of the horse, or I can couch the lance and charge. This is something you see on the Bayou Tapestry. I'm able to transmit the full force of a running horse through my body, through my arm, down into the spear tip, and it will go through anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this off and then start talking about some of those elite Anglo-Saxons and how they fought on foot. Now the Bayou Tapestry shows some of the Huskarl Anglo-Saxons using something like this, this ax, this gigantic Danish ax. You can see it's huge. The Bayou Tapestry actually shows this capable of cutting the head off of an entire horse. This will go through any armor, through any helmet when properly wielded. The problem is it takes two hands to do it. And as you'll notice, that means I cannot use a shield. So as a result, when I'm I'm going to need, I'm going to need someone who's standing next to me to actually have their shield ready to protect me. I may step out of the shield wall, swing my ax, kill a couple of Normans, and sink back in. So this Danish ax was an incredibly effective weapon, popular amongst the elite Anglo-Saxons, and actually after the Norman conquest, the Normans sort of picked this up as well because they realized it is an absolute brutal weapon. So that, in a nutshell, is the weapons, the armor, and some of the fighting equipment of the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of Hastings and during the Norman Conquest. It's fascinating stuff. We hope it's given you a little bit of interest in going out, finding out more about the events, the weapons, and the armor. There's lots of great resources, but the one I would recommend is a primary source. Go look up the Bayou Tapestry online. Several places have it. You can look at it in its entirety, and you will see everything we've talked about today in use as illustrated in the original 11th century. Thanks so much for joining us. It's members like you that make these programs possible. Happy Battle of Hastings Day, happy October, and until we see you again at the History Center or online, stay safe and take care. Hello everyone and welcome to this members only live stream that we are going to be doing today and we are very excited about it. It is October, and if any of you have been watching for any length of time, you know that I am fascinated with the Norman Conquest, the Battle of Hastings, and things like that. So we can't let an October go by without getting into that. So today, we're going to look specifically at the weapons and the armor of the Norman Conquest, and specifically the Battle of Hastings. We're not gonna go into the history. We have other past live streams. Hopefully, you can go back and take a look at those. But today, we're going to start out talking about the different types of soldiers, and the different weapons they would have used. So my base here is basic 11th century clothing. Now the quality would have varied depending upon your socioeconomic status, but basically it's going to consist of the same thing I have on uh, my braids, which are basically my medieval underwear, my 11th century underwear, and to that are tied braids, which are wool leggings, and they're tied on with points. I also have turn shoes that are just uh, uh, 